You're listening to The Dead Prussian, a podcast about war and warfare. Hi everyone, Amanda here. I'm just stopping by to ask you for your feedback on the show. It is important to us here at The Dead Prussian to deliver a show that our listeners enjoy. You can leave us a review on iTunes or head on over to our website and fill in the survey at www.thedeadprussian.com slash survey.html. We'd love to hear from you. G'day listeners, how are you going? It's Mick, your humble host here, actually the humblest host you've got. As you heard, uh, Amanda is still asking you guys to fill out that survey so we can know what you, the listeners, want for the show. Please fill it out. You'll have until the end of May and then I'll do my data analysis over June and then I won't change a single thing. No, that's a joke. I will respond to your needs as my listeners and see how we go. There are a few interesting comments. I would just like to remind everyone that this podcast, which is going to be a very ironic statement once I introduce the topic, is not just about Carl von Clausewitz. This is a podcast about war and warfare. So I understand there's a lot of people that want more knowledge on Carl. Please go over to Clausewitz.com, read Hugh Strawn's books, uh, read On War Itself, and also send us your questions about Carl so that then I can tailor specific episodes to your needs. Uh, but the podcast will remain as broad as possible on the topics of war and warfare. Thank you again for all those who have provided uh, iTunes reviews. I've seen another couple pop up in the States iTunes store. That's great. All those people over in Great Britain, uh, thanks very much uh, for providing absolutely zero reviews. You're a great bunch of people. All right, and today's topic. Today's topic's a little bit weird, a little bit irrational, one might say. We're going in and we're discussing Carl von Clausewitz. There you go. That's why my statement earlier is ironic. And... Alice in Wonderland. What do the two have in common, you ask? I don't know. That's why I've had to get a guest on the show. My guest today is Olivia Garrard. She is an officer in the US Marine Corps. She has a Master of Arts in War Studies from King's College London. Now, as with most of our service personnel here, Olivia is no different. Her opinions expressed are hers alone, and they do not reflect those of the Marine Corps, the US Department of Defense, nor the US government. What her views do reflect, though, are a very, very interesting take on the dead Prussian. G'day, Olivia. How are you going? I'm doing wonderful. I'm very, very excited to be here. Well, you'd be the first guest that is. Um, Thanks very much for coming on the show. Um, Now, I've given a very quick summary of of, your background. You're obviously a a bit of a warrior scholar type, um, currently serving, but... um, studied in you know one of the most prestigious war studies if not the most prestigious war studies department in the world that's the official version of you who is olivia um well i'm still i'm still working on figuring that out i'm uh still quite junior um so it's it's interesting for me to start to to get involved in these conversations uh with a bunch of theory and very little experience uh, I started out uh, studying I, in high school. I took a course facing wars or history. Um, was fascinated by it. Uh, knew I wanted to continue to study once I got to college or university, depending on who's listening right now. Uh, and was hell bent on being a surgeon. Uh, that, that was my my choice. Going to be um, science and everything. Uh, I got to college. Uh, it just wasn't for me. Um, took a pretty interesting set of courses and just realized I wanted to do philosophy and um, ended up uh, getting very interested in continuing to study war. I uh, was at Princeton and got uh, extremely lucky that I was able to go study um, in Vietnam, uh, learning about the war there. Uh, that Honestly, about two days before I, I left um, for Vietnam, I finally considered the military as, a, as an option and spent uh, most of my phone calls and letters home uh, telling my parents I wanted to join the military uh, while I was in Vietnam, which um, I would say is, is quite <laughs> ironic. That's a good way to tell your parents to make sure you're out of the country across a few continents first. Not only that, but I was also in Vietnam, which I, I think also adds to the irony. <laughs> um, so was there, knew that um, I started, wanted to do something different, uh, looked at the Marine Corps, was very excited by 
kind of their their intelligence um, in kind of the way that they think about war, their self-contained um, kind of function uh, as a, a mechanism for war just seemed uh, the most logical to me. And uh, kept studying war, eventually uh, got to the point where um, I commissioned, uh, but wanted to keep studying. And so I asked uh, to kind of push off going to active duty so that I could get a MA in mm -hmm. war studies. And the Marine Corps said yes. So I'm grateful for them for letting me do that. And then I went and uh, studied in England for a year. Um, it was fascinating. And uh, yeah, now I'm just uh, trying to put it all together. Excellent. Yeah, it's not um, often that someone of uh, your uh, junior rank within the military writes on some of these heavy topics, and it's great to see. Uh, so you're, you're a lieutenant at the moment, is that correct? Uh, first lieutenant, First yes. lieutenant, okay, and that's a, that's a lieutenant for all those Australian and British uh, people listening. So that's, uh, that's excellent to see such a, a junior rank um, go on to study and also write about these uh, sorts of topics because often what we find is young young people do a lot of study um, but don't feel that they have the experience to write, so therefore they don't write. Obviously, you've managed to combine uh, a fair bit of experience and practical experience into your studies, um, almost doing a social scientist version of a history degree by heading to Vietnam yourself. Oh, I think that um, that kind of appeal of uh, trying to write when you don't have experience, um, or lack of appeal, I should say, uh, is definitely where I'm struggling the most. And I think that's why I've appealed to literature and other avenues um, to kind of give me some authority that I don't really feel like I have because I don't have the experience right now. Yeah, so it, it's an interesting take because, you know, I don't mean to drag on about, um, you know, you're relatively juniorness in juniorness. That's not a word, but it is now, listeners, in uh, writing about these topics. I mean, you're competing with uh, um, some very, very experienced people, but what I'm interested in is what, what made you take the leap um, in writing about these topics? I'm not quite sure. Um, it's one of those that I think I wanted to be able to add to the conversation and you just end up sending your work off and someone, you know, either says no, thank you or yes, please. And I got extremely lucky with uh, the bridge that they were on the yes, please side. And, um, you know, once you kind of start to get that confidence, it, it allows you to keep questioning, keep writing about different things that uh, you might not have thought that you'd be able to. So essentially just shots on goal is really what it is. And what a great team the guys are at the uh, the bridge. That's the Strategy Bridge Journal, online journal. Uh, for those listeners, in fact, it was uh, Nathan Finney from the Strategy Bridge who uh, pointed me in Olivia's direction. Uh, he's a top bloke, and quite recently actually um, donated a kidney to a fellow soldier and got a pat on the back by the Undersecretary of the Army. That's, uh, that's how good a bloke he is. So to repay him, I've sent him a book review uh, for the bridge, which should given the editorial process I'll need to go through, be out within the next 10 years. Um, all right, Olivia, um, we've talked a little bit about you and also um, what I consider uh, quite a uh, brave step to step out into the conversation um, about some of these higher military theory techniques, particularly a controversial topic uh, like Klaus Sitz and anyone who thinks that 200-year-old uh, Prussians are not controversial needs to do some reading. What I found interesting was your article, Down the Rabbit Hole, Alice and the Experience of Klaus Switzian Genius. Now, being a, uh, a reader of um, many things Klaus Switz myself, I never, ever put together uh, Alice in Wonderland with 19th century Prussian military theory. That's probably a mistake of mine and a failing on my behalf, but what made you blend the two? And can you give us a little bit of a um, backdrop to that article for our readers that haven't gone on to the strategybridge.com and read that article? Certainly. Um, so 
just a, a brief summary, the Down the Rabbit Hole um, is looking at Alice in Wonderland and Clausewitz and linking them together by the use of how theory and reality um, work or fail to work together. And then specifically how where theory fails to match on to reality or where theory goes beyond reality, that difference, that space that's created uh, is where I believe genius, uh, specifically Clausewitzian genius, arises. And if you look at Alice's adventures, she's constantly confronting uh, a new reality, uh, a wonderful uh, reality that's exaggerated, illogical, nonsensical, and she's trying to take this theory that she has of what real life is or her childhood experience of what life is and try to match it on. And so you have examples where the Red Queen uh, is, tells you that you need to run backwards in order to get anywhere. And so Alice is getting confronted with all of these experiences that don't match to her theory of reality. And that I thought was a, a great lens um, to try and explain Clausewitz and his attempt to create a theory of war. And in doing so, realizing the limits of what a theory of war can uh, say. Yeah. And, uh, Sorry, go on. Uh, no, and, and with that, I think that um, how I chose um, Alice uh, and Clausewitz is a little bit uh, haphazard per se. Um, wanted to look at Clausewitz from a different angle and started out with a kind of a semantic look um, and realized that that was fairly superficial before delving into kind of a real kind of theory of what, what Alice is confronting. And that, um, and by doing so, that allowed me to really get into the uh, nitty gritty details of Clausewitz. It's interesting that you talked about the semantic look um, being quite shallow. I find that uh, that's probably the most common uh, analysis we see applied to um, class. It's, it's very semantical and also people looking for the checklist within to um, determine whether or not uh, he's applicable to these days rather than understanding the rational approach that he took, uh, which was pretty rare. I do have a question, though. If we look at Clausewitz's time, who is the Cheshire Cat? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, I don't know. Perhaps uh, <laughs> maybe uh, maybe his wife. I, I, <laughs> yeah, I don't I was, know. I was thinking some, something like that um, to keep him going on. I mean, obviously the Red Queen uh, must be Napoleon because gave him his best uh, material to work with by creating all those lovely walls um, to mess up uh, Europe. Um, but no, I was thinking, as I was reading through it, that's what I was expecting. Um, the article, I was like, oh, cool, maybe we'll find out if Scharnhorst and Eisenhower are at Tweedledum and Tweedledee. Um, and it'll be very interesting to see who the Mad Hatter was. Um, but no, it's uh, for those people that are looking for a recounting of uh, Al uh, Alice in Wonderland, uh, or a summary of on war. This is not the article for you. It's actually quite in depth on the uh, idea of how uh, Clausewitz uh, went about constructing a theory to explain the re the reality uh, that was being faced. I also note that you uh, give a reference to Ghost Fleet in here. What a great book that is! Oh, certainly. I I think that really you can take any any literature. Um, and any any source of uh, fiction, and you can use that to to look at various uh, Clausewitzian ideas and other theories. And really, we shouldn't box ourselves in in terms of we need to have nonfiction accounts or we need to, you know, have these very um, strictly academic uh, perspectives. I, I think that, and I hope that this article demonstrates that. If you look with a critical eye, you can you can find really cool connections and very perceptive connections uh, from from almost anywhere. Yeah, I recently read a uh, blog post on the um, Defence Entrepreneurs Forum Australia on a website called groundedcuriosity.com that asked the question of you know, exploring war through fiction versus history and what fiction can do to develop 
your understanding of the future fight. And having spoken to August Cole, one of the authors of Ghost Fleet on this show, um, I think what they've done is uh, attempt to do that um, by providing a, a fictional work that actually aids people in understanding where, where war and warfare is going. You've also written another article, um, I might add, on the Strategy Bridge uh, for all those listeners out there who uh, do read thestrategybridge.com and all those listeners who don't read thestrategybridge.com out there. Uh, you've got a phone, just do it. Um, this article is the objective value of Clausewitz. So what I'm seeing is um, pretty soon we're going to see um, Olivier Garrard, PhD, Clausewitz in theory. Um However, can you just talk us through that article? Because what I've found is it was an excellent follow-up in my mind um, to the work you did discussing uh, Clausewitz at the Mad Hatter's Tea Party. Well, uh, certainly that one stems um, connecting relativism and Clausewitz and using relativism as actually a justification for why we should think in a Clausewitzian way, which certainly seems uh, paradoxical at the outset, but one of um, the most interesting articles that I read uh, while I was in college uh, on relativism was uh, Catherine Elgin's um, uh, work that I, I cite in the article, and in it basically describes that any sort of facts that we consider about the world are filtered through some sort of value. We choose to hold a value steady uh, and as a constant, and through that value, we filter out facts. And I saw that as exactly how we choose to look um, in a Clausewitzian manner, is that we choose that, as of right now, Clausewitz has the best theoretical understanding of what war is. And so we choose right now to look at war as Clausewitz does, as war is the use of force in order to compel the opponent to do our will. And it's necessarily fundamentally instrumental, violent, and political. And we choose to to look at the world this way. And in it, we get all these sorts of facts about what is or is not war. And right now, specifically with the use of cyber and uh, uh, more robotics, uh, it seems to be challenging whether or not our value of Clausewitz is right. And what I think uh, appealing to Elgin is most interesting is that she acknowledges that any sort of theory that you come up with is limited by the sense that you don't know what's going to happen in the future. So you can't predict everything. And so the fact that Clausewitz is, is failing in certain areas is just indicative of how different the context is now, but not indicative of his theory being a problem. What it means is that today is more challenging than it has been, and so we just need to think through things differently. It's um, it's how does how can cyber be violent? Perhaps cyber can be violent because of my connection to my computer or my iPhone, or the fact that you know a credit system. Uh, on which I, you know, all of my finances depend, you know, might, might go away. And so that is violence to me, and it's just different form of violence. Um, so I think it's starting to look through things in that way, and that's why um, I choose right now to, to look with a Clausewitz and I. But if, if someone's able to prov- uh, provide me a better theory that, um, as I write, explains more and better, I'm certainly not uh, beholden to Clausewitz. Well, don't um, don't turn your back on Big Carl just yet because I don't think uh, anyone out there is writing uh, the next tome, although there might be. Um, I actually don't know everyone, so therefore I don't know that's uh, 100% true. I do like that um, you talk about cyber, and that's that's kind of a reference in, in your article back to Ghost Fleet about the conflicts depicted within Ghost Fleet uh, in this article. Um you know, it's very interesting, you know, if violence is the, you know, it's a harmful act inflicted upon another. Um, and usually we'd, we'd determine harmful being some sort of physical um, damage or destruction. However, you know, Stuxnet, uh, the flame virus that we've seen over the recent um, decade has 
come about in a way that can be described as violent. I mean, we know that um, the attack on the Iranian nuclear reactors um, actually caused uh, some physical uh, manifestation within um, the actual reactor itself that damaged some of the uh, equipment in there. So, you know, it's what might not be seen as an actual violent act in the physical completion of that act resulted in a destructive end. Um, and so we have to turn to things like Clausewitz and say, hey, how did he go about studying these things? How did he apply his series to the actions at the time? Um, but what I really like um, is your little bit uh, at the bottom of that article referring back to Big Carl, um, where you say, if not Clausewitz, then whom? And at the moment, I guess Big Carl doesn't really have too many competitors on the world stage when it comes to lofty tomes on the topic of war. Uh, he does definitely have some detractors, but uh, I'll try and get some of those guys on the show as well. Um, so here's my question. Um, flipping back to Wonderland, um, sounds like a great place to be. Um, <laughs> my question is, you know, you've, you've got a statement in there, therefore let us strive to be a bit more like Alice. Can you uh, unpack that statement a little bit more in terms of, uh, you know, is it the reaction to our environment when we come up against the unexpected? Is it trying to understand the reality that we're caught within? Um, am I way off? Um, please take over. No, no I, I think, I think you're, um, I, I definitely, uh, it's one of those sentences you write and you you like and you hope other people like them and like it as well. Oh, I like it. And <laughs> so I would I would say if I were to to unpack that right now that what I'm getting at is we need to accept the wonderland that we find ourselves in and we need to try and run backwards if that's what it requires. Uh if that's what allows us to communicate or to um accomplish whatever we need to in whichever wonderland we might find ourselves. And rather than trying to fight and redefine that wonderland and say, oh, things should go up when they go down or they, you know, we should be able to walk forward to get somewhere and instead be able to accept kind of with whatever flexi flexible theory we need, um, but without letting go of that theory wholly. Uh, so I think that's the spirit of Alice that we need to find. That's a, that's a very good way of looking at it. We need to uh, accept the wonderland that we are in. And for those people who uh, don't read much about Clausewitz or haven't read On War, uh, my summary of that is just read um, read book, books one and eight and you'll be fine. Uh, the rest of it's probably a different wonderland. Um, all right, Olivia. Uh, we're up to the final question, the most important question of the Dead Prussian podcast that a guest can answer. Um, this show's quest is to try and understand and study uh, war and warfare as much as possible and apply uh, the same sort of rigour that Clausewitz did uh, in his uh, lifelong work. I'm not saying we actually achieved that, but hey, everyone's got to have something to aim for. I am terrible at finishing my sentences, so I'm going to ask you to finish a sentence for me. I will give you a caveat, though. You cannot give me the Klauswitzian answer, otherwise I'll just keep recording until you uh, come up with your own uh, definition. Um, and that's mainly because, uh, through my recent feedback mechanisms I've got, I've been told I let a lot of people off the hook by just regurgitating something they read in an old Prussian text. Okay, can you finish the sentence, war is... Certainly. Um, I would, I, I was going to uh, pull up a, a Clausewitz um, phrase uh, or passage. It's not the, it's not the normal one. Oh, give us um, that one first. I, I, okay. Uh, war is not like a field of stocks, which without any regard to the particular form of each stock will be mowed better or worse, according as the mowing instrument is good or bad, but rather as a group of large trees to which the axe must be laid with judgment, according to the particular form and inclination of each separate trunk. Um, and I, I pick that one first, and then I'll give you um, a, a pithy one. Uh, I pick that one because I think that if you, if you really unpack that, you can find technological determinism in there. 
you can find the value or lack thereof of decisions, the, the necessity to look at each event, battle, operation unto itself and really try and figure out how you need to accomplish what you need to in that specific instance. And if I were to have a, a more, I guess, Twitter-worthy um, Yeah, one, that, that one's definitely hard to fit into 140 characters, but I dare some of our listeners to try. And your more pithy version? I would say um, War is a Wonderland. Oh, my God. So. That is excellent. War is a Wonderland. Um, that That is... The most unique. I thought we had a great one with Max Brooks last week, but uh, sorry, Max, you're off the team. Uh, War is a Wonderland. That is perfect. Um, John Mayer apparently is working on that as his next uh, big release. Um, and for all those listeners out there who haven't read Alice in Wonderland or the article by Olivia, uh, you probably won't quite get that until you uh, do. Although if you just listen to the John Mayer uh, song, you might understand that as well. Um, thank you very much for coming on the show, Olivia. Thank you so much for having me. And for all those listeners out there who haven't got the hint I've been trying to drop, uh, jump on to thestrategybridge.com. Uh, please read uh, Down the Rabbit Hole, Alice and the Experience of Klaus Witzian Genius, as well as the other article, The Objective Value of Klaus uh, both by Olivia. They are very good and most importantly, they are very accessible for those people that I find sometimes reading on this topic is a bit dry or that my sense of humour on episodes like this don't quite get you through uh, or as much information as you need. But I'll keep trying to have great guests like Olivia on the show. Okay, that's it for the episode today, but uh, a final wrap-up. Please jump onto iTunes, leave us a review if you uh, have time. You can leave us anywhere from one to five stars. Although I will say if you leave us anywhere between one and three stars, you're on your own because no one else thinks the same way you do. It helps us get it out to a broader audience. As I said in the start of the show, uh, those people in Great Britain or the United Kingdom, whichever your preference is to call that area, uh, really need to jump on board. I have no reviews in the UK, which makes me think I'm not reaching too many people. But from my Twitterverse conversations, I know I'm chatting to a few of you. Also, I'd like to advertise the Defence Entrepreneurs Forum Australia. It is a association uh, that sits next to the Australian Army and is starting to drive young junior commanders towards uh, bringing out some of the best and brightest ideas that they have. If you jump on groundedcuriosity.com, you'll be able to see their links uh, their blog posts, in fact, there's a blog post uh, penned by yours truly. However, I recommend you read the others first for quality, and then if you need some more words in your head, just go ahead and read mine. Uh, thanks very much for that, and until next time, grab a book and crack on. Join the conversation with us on Twitter at Dead Prussian Pod, on Facebook at The Dead Prussian Page, or on our website www.thedeadprussian.com. All show notes for this episode, as well as copyright information, can be found on the website. The Dead Prussian Podcast is written, produced, and hosted by Mick Cook. It is co produced by Amanda Levito. The music used throughout is Caught in the Beat by Broke for Free and is used under a Creative Commons Attribution License. All opinions expressed by individuals on the podcast are those of the individual and not necessarily representative of any other organisation.